Everyone, good night. Good evening. How are you? How are you doing? Are you feeling well? You're good. English. Are you, are you fluent? No. <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> me too, me too. Uh, so, uh, Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Works. So, uh, uh, for 12 years, uh, with my family, uh, I have lived in Higashikurume, to Tokyo. Yeah. So, uh, my name is David McDaniel. I'm Reese McDaniel. And Well, for this evening, the most important thing is. The most important thing. Jesus. Jesus. That he completely and totally loves you. Okay, so now I've subjected you to enough Japanese. We're okay, we'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Can we say thank you to my son for translating? <laughs> All right, the first thing we got to do is we got to get out of Bible study mode. Do you guys know what I mean by Bible study mode? Okay, I'll explain to you. Um, uh, you know, the Bible says really outrageous things. You guys get that, right? Yeah, I mean, like really outrageous things. And yet, because we're in church, what we do a lot of times is we'll hear these incredible things and we go, oh, yeah, uh huh. I mean, just like crazy stuff. It's like Bible study mode. We also call it the spirit of yeah, yeah. I'll give you an example. I'll give you, you know, it's like Jesus walked on water. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. That's, that's it. Because that's what happens, you know. People, you'll say that. It's like Jesus walked on water and everybody will go, oh yeah, right, huh? <laughs> See, and we don't think about it. We don't, we don't think about this incredibly wild, crazy thing. And, and let me illustrate it this way. Has any, have any of you ever gone kayaking out on the ocean or out on the ocean? Oh, you're done then, okay. So you're out there and you're kayaking and all of a sudden a freak storm comes up and waves are swamping over. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm about to die. And then, and then praise God, Jeff comes walking out to you. <laughs> see, even some of you just then were like, yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> And see, that's the same thing is, you wouldn't be like, oh no, we're gonna die. Oh good, it's Jeff. <laughs> You're not one of you would do that because it's walking on water, ready, ready? It's not normal. <laughs> so what most of you would do be like, oh my gosh, we're gonna die, ah! Because that's not normal to walk on water. And so we're gonna talk about some outrageous things tonight, not things I've read about, things I've seen, things I've heard. Um, and I wanna start off with a question. I actually really, I want, I want to see, you know, just what your thoughts are. How is it that we read about these outrageous things in the Bible, and yet most of us still see God, we see him as theoretically big, but we still kind of see him as practically kind of small. How did God get small to us? Yeah. When we're overcome with everyday life, we just kind of put him to the side. Oh man, that is a great answer. It happens to me too, you know. You read about these outrageous things, Jesus walking on water, healing the sick, casting out demons, and then you gotta pay the bills. I don't imagine you pay a lot of bills, you know? Yeah, your parents are like, uh, go pay the gas bill, please, right? <laughs> <laughs> what else? Yeah. Uh, we didn't see it ourselves, so it's kind of hard for us to believe. I think that's really good. We don't see it, we hear about it. It's somebody else's story, it's somebody else's book. And, and it's like, well, yeah, maybe. That's good. Um, yeah, over here and then over here. Yeah. We're not expecting for him to move. Like, we don't expect him to just, like, rain fire down. From <laughs> that's, that's, that's so good. I don't know what I would think of somebody who did expect him to rain down fire. You know, it's like, you'd be like, do not make me angry. <laughs> but it's true. We don't come in expecting. A lot of times we come in wishing. And sometimes wishing moves into hope. But it isn't expectation. Like, you know, when you pray for a sick person, a lot of us are like, I kind of hope something happens, rather than going, no, it's my job to pray, it's his job to heal, and I'm going to, to stand in the gap here and, and be that person who prays. Who else had their hand up? Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Because it's true, we hear about it, and we get what I would, or 
term I like to use is we get inoculated. You know how, ino- you know how vaccines work? Get just a tiny little bit and then your body can fight it off. Man, a tiny bit of the gospel can actually vaccinate you against the kingdom. Ooh. Everybody go, wow, that was good. <laughs> Dude, this guy's deep. <laughs> I want to I I read you something. And, and again, I need you to get out of Bible study mode. So even before I start reading, I want you to put your hand, I want you to put, you to put one hand on your heart, one hand on your mind. Can you do that? Your mind. I mean your head. If you put your hand on your mind, that gets really metaphysical, doesn't it? <laughs> and now I want you to put your hand on your mind. Okay, <laughs> let's, let's pray. So Father, what we ask right now, Holy Spirit, we invite you to come get us out of Bible study mode. We ask you to soften our hearts and increase our expectation. We ask you, Lord God, to prepare our minds to hear from you again and to get revelation and to understand more intensely what you want to do in our midst. You're a big God. You're a good God. And I ask you just to to come and help us to get it tonight in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right. So in John 14, Philip says, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. And Jesus says, have I been with you so long you still don't know me? Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak by my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me, I am in the Father, the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. I'm gonna paraphrase that. He's like, you're looking at the Father because I'm here, I'm here in front of you. I'm God made flesh. You're looking at me and what you've seen me do can help you understand who I am and what I'm like. And and it's really interesting. It says, believe on the count of the works themselves, specifically in the context of the supernatural and miracles. Then he goes on to say, now get out of Bible study mode. You've got to think about what I'm about to say. I want this to ruin the rest of your life. Say, thank you, Dave. Good, okay. Thank you, Dad. Dad. Thanks. (laughs) Okay. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. Wow. Yeah, right? Okay, let's stop there for a minute. What did Jesus do? Raise your hand and then just shoot it out. What did he do? Come on, it's not a trick question. Yeah. He intentionally hung out with sinners. He, He intentionally hung out with sinners. Ouch. Some, some parents are like, um, okay, go ahead. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, please. He died on the cross for us. Yeah, now, I don't know we have to do that part. I think he already accomplished that. So that's good. Yes. He walked on water. He walked on water. Okay, quick, quick, wait. Has anybody here, be honest, has anybody here ever tried to walk on water? Yeah. How wet did you get? I got really wet. <laughs> okay, okay. We're, I'll be honest, we're playing it kind of safe here. What else did he do? He healed sick people. Uh Uh-oh. Hmm. Yeah? He rose from the dead. dead. I I know a man who's raised somebody from the dead. For real. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, he, 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 he laid hands on blind people. They saw. Yes. He walked a lot. He walked. Greater works than these will you do in my name. It's pretty good. Pretty good, yeah. Yeah, he healed injured people. He cast out demons. He did all these crazy things. He says, you're going to do the same stuff. Do you believe it or not? No, No, I love that somebody was honest enough to say no. But I still, I think it's important that we actually are that honest because it's a starting point. Because then he goes on to say something else. He says, okay, I'll read it again. Truly I say to you, whoever believes in me, will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do. What? And greater works than these. I'm like, yeah, Nani? Who said that? (laughs) That was awesome. (laughs) That's like, what? (laughs) Are? Okay, sorry. (laughs) Greater works than these will he do, because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Okay, listen, I'm gonna cut right to the chase. This is not theoretical stuff for me, for a real simple reason. Because 12 years ago, 
You know, my family did something cr- completely, well, 16 years ago, we did something completely crazy. We sold our house and our furniture and our car, and we left everything, our television. Our, we, we had to leave our cat. <laughs> see, I knew that would, see, isn't that funny? It's like car furniture. Not the kitty. <laughs> And, and we, we joined this crazy organization called YWAM, and we eventually moved to Japan. And you know what? You get to Japan, and, and Jeff alluded to this, you know, we say there's 2% Christian. These are 2% of the people who go to church. But if you really pin them down, it's less than 1% of the people are confessing, active, seeking God believers. Less than 1% in a nation of 127 million people. Now, I'm not going to do a whole missions pitch about Japan tonight. I just want to talk to you that, that we have had to learn to walk in the reality of that scripture. We've had to learn to see it true. We've had to go after it because the other thing that is really interesting is Japan looks really modern. It looks really Western, but it's actually still a deeply spiritual place that believes in the supernatural. So I'm getting ready to go to Japan. We're stu- I'm studying. Normal people would study the language. I study history and culture. It's just the way God wired me. And so one of my friends goes, oh, have you ever seen a Japanese horror movie? And, and I'm like, and I'm sitting there going like, what do you mean like Godzilla? What are you talking about? <laughs> He's, no, 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 no. You got you to check this out. And he recommended, recommended a movie called Juon. Holy chamoly, that was a scary movie. I don't have a big open door to fear, but my wife doesn't watch scary movies at all, and I normally don't either. I don't recommend them. It opens doors to fear. But I watched this one movie, and because my wife was asleep, she didn't want to see it. I'm watching it at night in the dark with headphones on. (laughs) Stupid? Yes, I admit. So I'm watching this thing, and I, I spent the whole movie like... Oh my gosh, you know, that kind of thing. And so afterwards, I'm praying about it. I'm like, why was that so scary? Because um, I've seen scary movies in the past, you know, um, and, and I don't actually find them scary, except the occasional jump. But this one was scary. The Lord said something to me. He goes, you know, it's scary because the people that made this movie actually believe this stuff is true. Okay. And he said, I want you to do something. I want you to ask your Japanese friends how many of them have seen a ghost or something like that. Now, we know there's no such thing as ghosts. as demons who are lying and all this sort of stuff. But anyway, I asked, um, what percentage of my friends that I spoke to in Japan do you think have seen something overtly supernatural? What would you guess? 90%. To 80%. 80%. And I heard stories that I was like, Really? Now, here's where it encouraged me, though. Believe it or not, this has an encouraging end. Is the Lord said something to me. He brought me back to that scripture. And he goes, you know what? If they can see the lie, you can show them the truth. And if they believe in the supernatural that's a lie, that's a trick of the enemy who wants to destroy them, then you can show them the truth of a living God who actually said, greater works than these will you do in my name. You can actually contend for it. So we started diving into scripture. What does the Bible actually say? You know, trying to make sure that we're not getting weird. What does the Bible say? What do we get to walk in? And we just started asking God for stuff. How do we walk in the gifts that he promised? And we've been seeing stuff happen. And I realized just like all of you guys, that God had gotten really small for me. And it was the daily thing of hearing it a lot, not sure if I really believed it, paying the bills, all that stuff. And all of a sudden, I'm on the front lines of missions, and it's like, man, you got, you got to walk in it or you better go home. And so that's, that's what started happening. So the thing is, before we go into that, I actually want to talk a little bit about our image of God, because a lot of us, we do have pretty messed up images of God. So I'm going to go after that very, very briefly because we got to have some sense of who this God is that's asking us to walk in this kind of crazy stuff. So I'm just going to go ahead and pull up some images of of God, and we're going to talk a little bit about them. How do I do the clicker thing? The red button? The right button. There we go. (laughs) All right, so so what does this image of God make you think of? Santa? Santa? Uh, uh, What else? Yeah. Abraham. He just looks so, in my mind, kind of sleepy. <laughs> yeah. 
What's that? Ca- okay. See, now I said something that she wants to go. I'm like, can I sit on your lap? <laughs> and that's okay, though. That's okay. So for a lot of people, you know, he's like, you notice where he is. He's, he's in the clouds. Uh, I'll tell you a secret about my past. When I was young, I didn't want to go to heaven. No, no, I didn't want to go to hell either. Don't get afraid. I was, I was trying to find some other place because all of my theology was formed from Saturday morning cartoons. And so when Tom kills Jerry or Jerry kills Tom, where do they go? You know, they go to heaven. What's heaven always look like? Clouds. Clouds. What's he wearing? White. Right. And, and what's he playing? And I'm just thinking, I'm way too ADD for this place. <laughs> Because I, I knew I was going to be the first guy in heaven to get a timeout. Jesus is going to be like, sit in the corner. He broke the pearly gates, that kid. <laughs> and so this kind of image was not at all encouraging to me. So then, then let's, let's look at some other fun ones. <laughs> I, I, I just, but see, you'd be surprised how many people have a view of God that is like, He's just, he's just, don't make him mad because that, you're, you know, he's going to go into smite mode. <laughs> you know, and the funny thing is, look, he's smiting the moon there. It's like a test run or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I, this next one I kind of like. <laughs> it's buddy Jesus, wingman Jesus, you know. This Jesus is never bugged by anything. Hold on, it's my turn. Uh, so this guy, and he's like, hey, it's all right. Don't worry about it. I got you covered, you know. No, that judgment stuff, that's like all Catholic. Don't worry about it. No, uh, yeah, uh, no problem. Or how about this one? Look, look, look what he's adding. <laughs> Yeah, the people who read are getting it. Some people are like going, he's cooking. All right. <laughs> he's got his smite button, you know, he's like, he's like, I wish I, can you put a little echo on this just briefly? You ready? Give me a thumbs up when we're ready. Okay. Do not make me angry. I find this one super disturbing. <laughs> super disturbing. It's, it's some 80s form of internet Jesus. And notice, wait, wait, wait. Notice that he's got both a pause button and a volume control. <laughs> I don't want my Jesus to be able to be paused or me to be like, oh, Jesus, not so interested. Boop. No, not good. Oh, yes. Hunter and Wolverines with freaking 12 gauge? What do you think? All right. All right. This one's horrifying, too. This is, this is conservative Republican Jesus. <laughs> and, uh, and what conservative Republican Jesus, wait, wait, stay with me here. Notice that you've got like all the loyal right wing Republicans and You've got all the evil Democrats, and Jesus isn't holding the Bible. He's calling them back to the, the, de- the Constitution. <laughs> I, I, I teach all over the world, and I find this to be problematic. All right, so, uh, all right, let's, uh, let's keep going. Else, what else? Oh, this next one's a good one, too. Hipster Jesus. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah... I didn't actually turn water into wine, but I turned it into like craft beer. (laughs) So good. So good. And this next one, I hope I don't get in trouble for this next one. I just, this makes me laugh. (laughs) Yeah, that's... They are admittedly, stay with me here, they're admittedly funny images, but you know, all of them in some way represent how we've taken this really big God and made him small and manageable and safe or distant or irrelevant or evil 
or capricious is a good word. Look that up. I'm not going to define it for you. So, you know, and what happens though is then we come to a place where some crazy guy from Japan starts telling you, you're going to do greater works than these. And, and we've got images like this in our head. And so we, we've got to do something. So what, is, what does the Bible actually say about God? And I, you know, I went to a couple different Bible schools. And I went to university. I went to seminary. And I am going to uh, boil down tens of thousands of dollars worth of theological education for you. You ready? This is going to be awesome. It's like totally free. Say thank you, Dave. There we go. Okay, so nature and character. I'm going to just put it really simple. God's nature is basically what's his essence and his character is what's he like. And I'm not going to make this super complicated. We're not going to have a big theology lesson. Do not be afraid. But like just to define it, God's nature, you know, what do we mean by that? You know, his essence, his ability, you know, you know, it's like, what is the substance of him? What can he do? And the other one is his character, which is like his heart and his ways. Okay. So it's like, basically, what's he like? What does he do? So that's, that's just to make it really simple. So I, how do we make it simple? I'm, I'm just, okay. So, so, so stay with me here. Ready? Um, so here's, here's the big revelations. Ready? So I need a drum roll. First one, God is big. Yeah, come on. That's right. Very proud. It's deep, right? Some of you are like, Jeff, don't invite this guy back. <laughs> okay. And the second one, drum roll again. God is good. Yeah. Listen, it sounds overly simplified, but to keep in mind that God is big and he's good is actually the most attacked thing in your life. Who here has ever prayed for somebody that did not get better? Come on, be honest. Me too. And you know what? Satan is a real person too. And he hates you and he hates God and he hates the kingdom. What he does is he comes and he accuses those two things. He comes and he says, you know what? God didn't heal because it's not true. It doesn't really work. It's all baloney or whatever word you might insert there. And, and you know what? That's what happens. He comes and he accuses the bigness of God. Or he says, ah, you know, God's really busy. He's, he's really busy with what's going on in Syria. So he doesn't really care about your friend here. He's not really good. And so the thing is, if we lose sight of either one of these things, you know what? It becomes religion really stinking fast. But the thing is, I want, us to get this idea deep into our heart that God is good and God is big. Say it with me. God is good. and God is big. God is good. God is big. See, if you can remember those two things and read the Bible through that lens, you have to start doing something with it. Because it's like, well, you know, this crazy stuff, it's, it's you know, it, it's, and it's important that he's both. He's got to be both good and big because he's asking us to surrender everything. So he's got to be Big enough to do what he says and good enough to want to lead us with love. And I believe in both those things. And I'm going to tell you why here in a little bit. All right. So some scripture with that, just real quick, just to make it legal. Okay. One thing God has spoken, two things I've heard that you, oh God, are strong and that you, oh God, are loving. And that is a verse to, you know, I challenge you to memorize that one. All right. I'm kind of cruising here because... Really, honestly, I want to tell you a bunch of stories. Is, it, is that going to be okay with you guys? Yes. All right. So, so um, we're going to pull up the sound for this next one because I wanted to. I, I thought there's a bunch of ways I could talk to you about God being big, but I think I just want to put it in perspective this way. So, um, let's go ahead and uh, get this going. <laughs>
everybody do this. Go. <laughs> okay. So there's a scripture that says, he measures the universe by the span of his hands. So God, you know, we just saw that, right? So God, how big is the universe? Yeah, it's about there. Yeah, it's right about there. You know, I could put the entire galaxy in my belly button and still have, <laughs> still have room for Lent. And so here's the thing you got to get is that God who made that, who measures the universe like that, who counts the stars every night, calls them out by name, counts them to make sure none of them have gone astray. That God knows the number of the hairs on your head. Not just how many. It's like if I were to grab one of Emma's hairs, dink, he'd be like, that's number 30,105. <laughs> that's this God. This God lives inside of you. And when you get that, there's nothing you won't be able to accomplish in Christ. And, and you've got to let that sink in for a minute, you know. Um, any Doctor Who fans? Okay, okay. So uh, what is the thing they always talk about, the TARDIS? It's bigger on the inside. Okay, well, I want to develop some like Doctor Who theology in this room that you all recognize that you're bigger on the inside. So I think it's just important that we get this. So... Let's move on to the next one, which is, I think, pretty important that we talk about this as well, because it's God being good. And I think, okay, we could talk about God being good in lots and lots of ways. Um, and, and it's he's loving, he's kind, he's uh, wise, he's gentle, he's compassionate, he's merciful. But you know, the one I like to hammer is that he's funny. You ever think of God as being funny? Listen, Okay, the Bible teaches we're created in the image of God, right? Who here likes to laugh? Raise your hand if you like to laugh. Raise your hand if you like to make somebody else laugh. Okay, so guess what, you guys? If you're creating the image of God, that makes God the funniest person in the universe. <laughs> Think about it, and I, I'm gonna prove it to you, because part of my theology is, all, no, cartoons was not so great, um, but like the zoo. Anybody like to go to the zoo? God, God is a creative genius. He's an artist. He, you know, do you know there's 99 species of parrot? Wow. How many species of parrot do you need? <laughs> and you, you, I kind of picture God during creation is like, he's on a parrot kick. I don't know what's going on. He's like, oh my gosh, look at this one. And all the angels are like, oh, yes, that's another parrot. But it's got yellow right there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or like, a whole bunch of horses go by and he's like, wait, 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 Doom. giraffe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just have this image of God as just being this kind of creative maniac that I really enjoy. And I'm not meaning to be casual or disrespectful here, but I just, this is something that touches my heart. And I thought, how do I talk about the goodness of God? So, so here we go, here's one of my favorites. Um, ready? The star knows mole. <laughs> Those are all noses. <laughs> and this is in the Guinness Book of World Records for being the fastest eater in the world. It can eat a worm in under a second. And it's like, it goes feeling, and it, check this out. It takes little 3D pictures of the dirt with its nose. And then it figures out where the worms are and it goes, Dum. all right, next. <laughs> And you know that nobody sees that, but God, God's like, ate another worm. That's so cool, man. Okay, what about this one? <laughs> the blobfish. That's right. You know that fish is like, ah, what am I doing here? All right. <laughs> All right. That is, that is a real thing. That is a coconut crab. And I, there is so much nope on that, I can't even tell you how much nope there is on that. That is a blue sea dragon, and believe it or not, that's a slug. I know, I mean, have you ever wanted to cuddle with a slug? I want to cuddle with that slug. <laughs> this one is called, ready? It's the sea pig. And I actually, I actually feel like I got revelation on how God created this one. Ready? Okay, be quiet. Ready? Oh, I'll keep it. So... <laughs> Okay, imagine you're swimming and that comes out of the dark at you. 
You know what you do? You'd be like, ah, ah. Oh, it's only that big. Ping. That's what you would do. <laughs> it's only that big. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Baboon. Beautiful. Noble animal. Not my favorite view. That's my favorite view. <laughs> no, because, you know, God's like, Oh, it's so beautiful. But he's, I think he's got this slightly twisted sense of humor. He picks up, grabs some sandpaper. <laughs> now we got it. All right. <laughs> All right. I know. I love that you guys do that about a fish. It's like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> it's a puffer fish. This is a form of self-defense as though being a balloon is the most terrifying thing in the ocean. It's like, oh my gosh, it's a balloon. <laughs> it's probably because the fish are afraid of the clown. That might, never mind. Anyway, uh, there's actually, I, we lived in Hawaii for a while, and there was a, a shark that was found dead with a live puffer fish in its throat. Now, it, now listen, again, picture this. Mighty Predator, dun 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 dun, shum, <laughs> and God's like, did you see that? It was awesome. All right, <laughs> all right. Okay, you guys are getting the point. I see God is really, really good. I see him as fun, funny, but also compassionate, brokenhearted. He, you know, he can't turn his television off and turn away from all the evil things happening in the world. He has to see it all. He is a God of judgment. He is a God of justice, but he also made the puffer fish. <laughs> you know, he, he measures the universe by the span of his hands. And that God said, greater works than these will you do in my name. So we moved to Japan, right? And when we get there, one of the things that Lord told us to do is a lot of what Jeff was talking about just a little earlier, which is, you know, we've got to actually have a higher view of worship. That's the first thing he had to start doing is taking worship more seriously. And, and you know, I've never thought of worship as, as song times. I never did because I had a, a pretty powerful encounter with God during worship, another story for another time. But I really have seen how worship changes the atmosphere of our hearts, changes the atmosphere of our rooms, changes the atmosphere of our communities. And so what we began to do, and, and I can't go into all the detail, but we, the Lord told us, build the altar of worship. Now, mind you, this is like us contending for the supernatural and to re work, learning to walk in what the Lord promised. And what did he tell us to do? Worship. See, a lot of people think of like the supernaturals, like the pixie dust that God, uh, you know, whoop, beep, now you can do supernatural things. <laughs> and it's not like that. It's because it's a person. And when we learn to host the presence of this person, this person is the one doing stuff. We're just simply letting him flow through us. And one of the easiest ways to learn to do that is become a worship addict where you just worship and you worship and you start thinking, I don't, it's not just like, oh, I like this song. It's like, I believe this song. And I'm going to proclaim this song. And you know what? I'm going to command my heart to rise up in agreement with this song. And then the Lord tells us, now I want you to take this out on the streets. And so we started taking a worship team to like parks with homeless guys and we just start worshiping. And not music ministry. We weren't trying to grab a crowd. We literally just worship. And it was kind of fun to see the things that would start happening. Um, this business guy, he walks by and there's all these crazy foreigners. We got... 14 different nations in our location. And he walks by and there we are just singing our brains out to Jesus, worshiping just like we were in our own private spaces. And we're just lifting up the name of Jesus in this place. And he walks by and he goes like this. And then he stands there for 45 minutes, 45 minutes. Now I'm thinking to myself, I'm a good missionary, right? So like, oh, I need to go talk to him about Jesus. God goes, stop. Why? I'm supposed to go tell him about you. Isn't that why he's here? Stop. You don't know what I'm doing. Okay. So I'm sitting there trying to worship and I keep looking. I'm hoping he's still there. And literally 45 minutes. Finally, the Lord says, go talk to him. I get up there. And he starts the conversation. I go, hi. He goes, what are you singing about? Well, we're singing about Jesus. Why? 
I feel peace. I never feel peace. I just was walking by and I thought you looked strange and I was kind of offended because Japanese don't do this. And I'm like, not Japanese. So, uh, and uh, he's, he's uh, you know, watching, talking to us and, and we start talking about Jesus and he just literally starts asking questions. And it was evangelism made easy because he encountered God and wanted to know what it was he was experiencing. And, and so we've been seeing things like this happen all over. The Lord told us to start a worship meeting in the heart of the city um, called the living room. And the image was that it would just be like a friend's living room. Instead of it being like a church setting, it's like, come in, man, if you want to dance, dance. If you want to sleep, sleep. We had one businessman who would come in and he would fall asleep the first hour every week. He, and I, he was like, I'm sorry. I go, bro, I think you're tired. Businessmen work really hard. Take your nap. Have anointed dreams. I'm totally cool with it. And so he would sit in the back and, and he snores, which made worship awkward sometimes. <laughs> I love you, Lord. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but, you know, we started just, again, learning to lift up the name of Jesus. And then crazy stuff starts happening in our worship meetings. Now, when you sing about the love of God, you know, for most of us, it's not a particularly controversial subject. You may believe it or not believe it, but the Japanese, they grow up feeling so rejected, you guys. So many of their fathers work so many hours that they don't ever really feel loved by anybody. And so we start proclaiming, and I'm using that word on purpose, in worship, proclaiming the love of God. And the room actually gets heavier. Now, do you guys know what I mean when I talk about the room feeling heavier? How many of you are kind of discerning? You can kind of tell what's going on. You just sort of feel stuff. Yeah, that's a good thing. That's a good thing, you know? And so I would feel the room get heavier and it's because it would be hitting so much unbelief. Now, what I used to do in the old days, I'd be like, you know, let's you know, sing about the love of the Lord. Okay, that didn't go well. Next song. But now we don't do that. We're like, okay, now we know what Holy Spirit's going after. So we start going after unbelief where the love of God is concerned. And like, Lord, what's the root of it? Sometimes it's offense. Sometimes it's people that have been really hurt or wounded or brokenhearted. And so we start going after this stuff. And one time we're declaring the love of God and we're going after something. This woman screams, falls out of the chair and starts slithering on the ground like a snake. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm like, well, hello, Beelzebub. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and so, like, you know, we, we, we had to, to cast this demon out of her. This woman was demonized. And, you know, the thing is, fully 25% of Jesus' miracles were around the demonic. If you read the Bible, add it up. Look at the miracles. You don't need to be afraid of this, but I'm going to tell you something. There's people that just need to be set free. And as we've been worshiping, we've been seeing more and more crazy stuff. This businessman's walking by me. He's wearing a really expensive suit. He's got a briefcase. He walks by, normal looking guy. And all of a sudden he sees me and he goes like this. And then he shakes his head and walks on. I'm like, all right, Lord of the Flies is here too. So no, <laughs> you know, I was on a train and I was thanking God for something. And it just really, really quietly just said, oh, Thank you, Jesus. And the guy behind me goes, yeah. I was like, was that a coincidence? Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> and because I'm a jerk, I did it a third time. <laughs> and so, you know, we're, one time we, we, we have a house church network that, we're, that we run and, and <laughs> this one woman, she came in the room. You know, the more you deal with this stuff, the more you get comfortable with dealing with this stuff. And this woman walks in our house and I have a couple of really pretty powerful intercessors in my group. And the minute she walked in, my spirit goes, oh no. And I look over and they're like, hmm. <laughs> and so I'm about, I'm about to go into this song and I knew in my spirit, this will be the song. So we start singing this song and she starts screaming and screaming and screaming. And my prophetic people get around there, they start praying, and I'm still playing my guitar. <laughs> Musical accompaniment to deliverance. It was kind of like, I, I made this joke the other day, and it just still makes me laugh. I've been thinking about it since, and you know, it's, it was kind of like lounge deliverance. You know, it's like, doom, dip, doom. hey, got a lot of demons in this room. How many of you from Cleveland? <laughs> uh, and so, so the thing is, 
she's screaming and, and we're in Japan and Japan, the walls are like this thick. And the neighbors, I'm thinking, oh, they think we're a cult now. Great. <laughs> no, it's, this is no joke. Our first Japanese house, how many of you live in two-story homes? Your parents want your attention. What do they do? Yeah, right? See, this is America, baby. I mean, it's like, it's dinner time. No problem, right? So we were doing that. We didn't even think about it. One day, a year and a half living in this place, and I hear my neighbor. Oh, my gosh. And then I hear them start talking. Oh, Jesus. And I'm thinking, they've heard everything. So, so back to our story here. This woman is screaming her brains out. And I'm thinking that they're going to call the cops. So Jesus commanded things to be quiet. So I said, in the name of Jesus, be quiet. And I've seen some fun stuff. But this woman goes like this. She looks at me with hatred in her eyes. And she goes to scream again. She, she goes, and she can't scream, you guys. I'm not making this up. She can't scream. I'm like, all right then. I'm still playing my guitar. <laughs> you know, this is a little party that goes, hey, hey, but I didn't do that. Uh, so eventually, because I, I am a, a, a good Christian, a real missionary, I put my guitar down. And we went after this thing. And you know what, you guys? Let me tell you something. What had happened in this woman's life is that she had been betrayed by people who called themselves Christians, who had really, they'd really abused her and they'd betrayed her, and she really thought it was God's fault. And so she was totally offended at God, and she had allowed bitterness towards God to enter her heart to the point that she gave access to this thing. And so we walked her through forgiveness towards these people and towards God. And you know what? She broke this thing off, and the thing came right out. And it was, it was amazing. It was amazing seeing stuff like this. The other thing that we've been seeing more of in Japan, again, greater works than these. You know how Jesus had this annoying habit of not answering people's questions directly. Have you guys noticed that? They'd ask him a question, what about this? And he'd go, well, you have heard it said. You know that some of his own followers are like, I'm gonna punch that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Just answer the question. <laughs> Just answer the question, you know? And so I, I find it really fascinating um, how often, let's see, how do I wanna frame this up? How often people would ask him something and he instead he would go to the heart of the matter. And the reason was is because he knew what was going on because the Lord is, you know, he's, he's God, but he's also listening to Holy Spirit, you know, and we could talk about that from, you know, lots of places, but um, he was, he is, always will be God. And don't, let's not get confused about this. But the thing is that was fascinating is it's like he then would, you know, Paul writes, earnestly covet to prophesy. So we realize that, man, you can argue somebody into the kingdom of God, or you can just through the Holy Spirit, we jokingly call it read their mail. And uh, we had one of our guys um, who wanted to do evangelism, didn't like preaching in the streets, didn't like to sing, didn't like most of what we did. And that's cool. That's fine. It's not for everybody, but he still worshiped with us. He asked the Lord, Lord, how would you like me to do evangelism? And he heard the word darts. <laughs> darts. And so he buys himself a dart set and he finds a dart bar that caters to teenagers so there's no alcohol there. And he goes there and he just plays darts. Yeah, okay, gets better. And this group of high schoolers start showing up. They're studying English. He's like, I speak English. So, so he goes over, hey, you know what? I can help you with this. And they're like, okay, great. And every week he'd play darts till they got there. They'd sit, study English and he would just talk about Jesus, just slip it in there. Finally, one of them says, you know, you talk about God a lot, but how can we know it's true? Now, this friend of ours, you know, he, he isn't particularly moving in the supernatural so much. No big deal. We have a big team. He goes, I got somebody I want you to meet. I got this couple that, we, that was on staff with us at the time. He's from Washington State. She's from Norway. They bring these five high schoolers over to their house. And Pete is the guy's name. And he goes, okay, first of all, I'm not a fortune teller that's demonic. It's not of God. I don't know anything of you. What's going to happen here is there's a God who knows you. He's going to talk to us about you, but it's him. It's not us. And then they start praying and prophesying over these people. And have you, anybody here ever watched a Japanese game show? Okay, so you'll get the reference here because... These guys are scary, accurate, word of knowledge kind of stuff. You know, this happened to you, or this is going on with your family. And you watch the other four go, yeah! <laughs> Just like a game show. <laughs> and they were all freaking out. You know, How do you know this? And he kept saying, I don't. The Lord knows it. He's telling 
because he wants you to know that he knows you because he loves you. And you know what? At the end of the time, they all left and not one of them came to Christ. And you think, what? How is that possible? But what was fascinating is one of the girls called them up later, said, can I, can I come over again? I said, yes. She came over and said, I just couldn't believe what happened in my heart. I want more. What's going on? And they prayed, and then the Lord began to open up some much more personal things that would have been inappropriate to bring up in front of all of our friends. And she wept, and she repented, and she asked Jesus into her heart because the Lord himself reached out to her because these guys were doing these, these works that Jesus promised. She goes to school the next day. Her friend comes up to her and she goes, what did you do? She says, what do you mean? She goes, did you get a haircut? Did you get a beauty? Did you, you know, new makeup or some kind of makeover? And she goes, no, why are you saying this? She goes, you look so pretty. And I'm just wondering what you've done. And she said, I met some people that told me the secrets of my heart. And I've become a Christian. And this friend said, can I have this too? And they went over to their house and again, walked these ladies through much more stuff. And that girl became a Christian. And they both ended up going to the U.S. and going to a Christian college together. And they're serving the Lord here in the United States. You guys, your schools, your sports clubs, this church, your city, there's an army in this room. And when you get hold of the idea that there's this good big God that wants to use you, when you get hold of the idea that these greater works are for you, and I'm not talking about becoming some weirdo, I'm talking about what the Bible says and learning to walk in it. God can use you to shift things in your community. How many of you would like to be part of that? How many of you would like to walk in this stuff? Don't be shy. Yeah. Okay, if, if you raise your hand, I want you to stand up right now. Can I, I, I really want to do uh, Great is the Lord again. Can we, can we get that? There's a, there's, so what I'm going to do is something, because of the, just the size of the group we got going here, I want you to do something that hopefully doesn't feel too weird. But I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to put your hands in front of you like you're receiving a gift. And there's nothing magic about that. It just activates your faith. And I want you right now, to do something. I want you to ask the Lord in your words, not my words. I want you to ask the Lord to increase your expectation of what he says he will do in your life. That I want you to ask him, Lord, help me to believe that your word is true, that it's not just theology made up by men, that even though I haven't seen it, I can see it and I can walk in it, and that you can use me to shift nations. I want you to do in your word, take some time just to pray over yourself right now. Repeat after me prayers have their purpose. I'm going to tell you the essence of what I'm going to do so you can be agreeing with it when I'm praying. But I want to invite you to, to repeat after me a prayer that you're going to invite the Lord to come in and shift your expectations. You're going to invite him to reveal his goodness to you. You're going to invite him to reveal his bigness. And that you're going to ask him for the grace, for the cost that, it, that may come with this. Because I, I don't want to be... Uh, I don't want to be too fluffy here at this last moment. This has cost, I, it's funny, I would say it cost me everything and it cost me precisely nothing because Jesus did it all. But I did have to learn to lay some things down. I didn't get to live life the way I wanted anymore. So, but I'm telling you, God's good. He's big. It's been worth it. So I want to lead you in a prayer. And, and I really want you to not just repeat it. I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to engage your heart in what I'm about to pray. So just say this after me. Holy Spirit, you are God. And I invite you now to come transform my mind, to soften my heart, to increase my hunger, to walk and act according to your word. Not striving to be a good boy or girl, 
but walking in what you promise. So give me a gift of faith to step into the things of God. Use me to transform my school, to transform my city. Lord, if you want to, send me to the nations. I don't belong to myself. I belong to you. So Lord, whatever the cost, give me the grace because I want more. I want what you promise in your word. Father, I believe it has to be true. So Holy Spirit, I give you permission to do it. So we're going we're gonna to sing Great Are You, Lord, again. And, and, and I want us to activate our heart. Not just, don't just sing it. You got to proclaim it. You got to pull something up out of you. Call your spirit man up and lay hold of this thing and proclaim it as we're singing it. Engage your heart in it. Call yourself up higher. And so we're going to do more than sing this. We're going to pray it. We're going to do some warfare with it. So you guys, let's, let's go after this right now. You give life, you are love. Come on, you guys. You bring light to the dark. Lift your voice, lift your you voice, let's go. Hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And pray. Yo!